Well, good morning and welcome. Welcome to City Ridge Baptist Church. My name is Matthew Cook, and I have the privilege of being our children and families pastor here. And so it is really great to see all the kids in church this morning, and glad you could make it out during this holiday break. And if you're visiting and here for the first time, we just want to include, make you feel welcome. And if you're looking for a church home, if you're seeking a new, new church family for, for this coming year, then please consider uh, City Ridge Baptist Church as being a place you can come and join us here. We'd love that. That'd be terrific. The California coast was covered in heavy fog on a July morning, 1952. 21 miles to the west on Catalina Island, a 34-year-old woman waded into the water and began to swim towards California, determined to be the first woman to do so. Her name was Florence Chadwick. And she had been the first woman to swim the English Channel in both directions just in the two years prior. And the water was extremely cold that July morning. And the fog, the fog was so thick that she could, she could hardly see the escorting boats that were within her own party. And millions were watching this event on national television. In this record-breaking attempt, she is risking hypothermia with sudden fluctuations in water temperature notorious for these waters, matched with unpredictable currents that can sweep her miles off course and the distant horizon. Wow, continually plays tricks on her mind, causing dis disorientation and illusions. But you see, Florence Chadwick, she is a champion athlete. She is a specialist. She is a long-distance swimmer that has trained season after season after season, a, prof a proven performer, and you know this is her thing. This is the one thing that she does. As the hours ticked by, she pressed on and she swam, determined to break the record. In these swims, fatigue had never been her big problem. But on this occasion, it was the bone-chilling water, the coldness that began to set in. And so more than 15 hours later, completely numbed with cold, she pleaded. She pleaded to be taken out. She couldn't go on, and yet she's a specialist swimmer. And she pleaded to be taken out. And her mother and trainer alongside the boat, they reassured her that they were near land and they worked so close, they urged her not to quit. Don't give up, Florence, not yet. You've worked so hard, you've come so far. Keep going, Florence. When she looked up and looked towards the horizon, frozen and tired, all she could see was the dense, thick fog over the California coast. And so Florence Chadwick was lifted out of the freezing cold water only half a mile from the finish line. And a dream had not been realized. A little while later, and upon reflection, looking back on her attempt, she admitted that it was not, it was not the extreme cold, the fatigue that was causing her to feel this way and wanting to be pulled out, but it was the fog. It was the fog that had obscured her goal. It was the only time that Florence Chadwick would ever quit. And so here we are this morning, just a few days out, standing on the other side of a whole brand new year. It's just about to begin. Is it just me or has this year just flown by? It's been so quick. The year has gone so fast and so much has happened. There's so much we have and so much we haven't done. And, and now we're staring down the barrel at yet another year that's loaded with goodness and surprises. Are you looking back? Are you reflecting on the year that you've just had? What are you feeling? What are you seeing? How are you reflecting on those things that have taken place this year? Do you look back with great memories, goals that have been achieved? Perhaps you've had a new promotion at work and your children have gained another year at school and your holidays this year were the best ever. Maybe your, your children graduated in year 12 and so that's successful and that's fantastic news to see them come all the way through their schooling years. There have been so many highlights, the list just goes on and on of all the things that have gone so well. But maybe for others, it's a combination of both and you're kind of glad that this year is almost over. 
And you're feeling like it's a year that I'd rather forget. It's been so tough. I didn't expect this year to be so hard and so tiring. And at times I found the trials of life to be so overwhelming. And the reality is that when we're feeling like this, it can be really hard to keep a positive outlook, especially when it comes to living out our faith in our daily walk and devotion with God. And so this is the question that we're seeking to answer this morning. How do I find joy and hope in living a new year for God when I'm struggling to forget the year that I've just had? Is there tension in your heart this morning? Is there a deep wrestle that's going on within your soul for first place? Is this how you're feeling about your, your love and your walk with God? That I love God. I love Jesus. I love his son. I love him with all my heart, but it's been a really hard year. And at times I've doubted the struggles in life have been so hard to overcome. And it looks like they're just going to continue into the next year after this. How do I find joy and hope to live out a new year for God when I'm still struggling to forget the year that I've just had? You see, the Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Philippian church, the whole book, it overflows with joy and thanksgiving and hope. And this is how Paul opens up his letter in chapter 1. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy. Because of your partnership in the gospel, from the first day until now, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart. Imagine if all of our Christmas cards had a message like this. Joy and thanksgiving and hope. What a massive encouragement it was for the Christians in Philippi as they read this letter. And what a massive encouragement it is to us because we share the same love through our Lord Jesus. But hold on a minute. This letter that the Apostle Paul is writing to the Philippians, a letter of joy and thanksgiving and hope, is from where? Where is he writing this letter from? It's from prison. And Paul's incredible love for Jesus and for the love of his church could not be contained. And Paul was continuing to live every day and every moment for the Lord to become more Christ-like, no matter what situation he found himself in. For me, I felt many times that this is a year that I'd rather forget. And in some ways, I feel a little embarrassed about the circumstances that I, I found myself in this year. And I have to be honest that I'm not necessarily looking back with fond memories. A few weeks ago, I shared how much I had struggled with doubt for most of the year, serious, unbridled, and sinful doubt that led me to the point where I was questioning my call as a pastor. But God's grace, and by his gentle hand and loving hand, he brought me to a point where I began to see the bigger picture through some very difficult circumstances that I needed to come to Jesus to seek his forgiveness, to accept his grace, to surrender my fears and my doubts and to trust him for his guidance and direction. As I look back, I can see how God changed me, not just in small ways, but in significant changes of character that seem to be long-lasting, the ones that have strengthened my faith, that have deepened my love for Jesus. But yet, it is so hard to not keep feeling that it's a year and it's a memory that I'd rather forget. In so in Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 to 14, Paul reveals a three-part answer to our question this morning, to the very question that I've been asking myself at different times. How do I find joy and hope in living a new, a new year for God when I'd rather forget the one that I've just had? And the first part of our answer that we see in our text is this, that we need to forget the past. Just leave it behind. It's found in verse 13. Let's look down and see what Paul says. 
and page 981 of our Pew Bibles, if you're following along. Philippians chapter 3, verse 13. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind. What's the one thing that the idea that Paul is making reference to? But the one thing I do, he says. How many times have you heard someone say, okay, you've got to listen now. This is really important. Are you ready to hear what I've got to say? Kids, how many times you've heard mum and dad say this? I've just got one thing to say. It's really important. You've got to listen now. This is good information. And so you know that I've got to tune in to what's being said. Or maybe you can relate to this. The one thing, just the one thing I needed to do was to buy some cans of corn at the supermarket on my way home from work. That's all I had to do. Do you know, I went to the supermarket with this one thing in mind to buy the corn. Just one thing. One thing is all I had to do. But I took one glimpse, one look at the chocolate and chips aisle and that one thing was gone. I'd forgotten about the one thing. It disappeared and I left Coles pretty pleased that I'd saved 50% on some chips and some lollies. But I'd forgotten the corn, the one thing that I'd been asked to do. And so luckily I remembered before I left the car park, I could buy the corn. You see, Paul is giving us some crucial life-changing instructions. By this time, Paul has been a Christian for around 25 years, and so he has preached the gospel. He has written letters. He has planted churches. He has suffered persecution. For he is a seasoned, God-fearing man, and now he's writing to this much-loved group of Philippian people from within a prison. And he's wanting them to please take note to this valuable life lesson that, that Jesus has shown him. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind. In Philippians chapter 3, Paul is creating a picture of the Christian life being compared to running a race. But like any sporting event or contest, you need to be in it to win it. And Paul knew exactly what it was and where he, where he stood before God that Jesus Christ was his Lord and Saviour because in verse 12 he writes these words, Jesus has made me his own. And Paul's motivation to run the Christian race, he was found on the fact that he knew that without any doubt that he was a child of God, that Jesus had gripped his heart, that Paul had been captivated by wanting to know Jesus Christ and to be like him. We see this back in verse 10 of Philippians chapter 3, and Paul says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. This morning, are you in the race? Do you know for sure that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Saviour and that he has gripped your heart and that he has captivated your love and your attention for him so that you can confidently say, as Paul did without any doubt, that Jesus has made me his own. So when Paul writes to his Christian brothers, this is equally relevant to us. Forgetting what lies behind it's the first thing we need to do when we're asking this question, how do I find the joy and the hope in living a new year for God when I'm struggling to forget the new one that I've just had? Forgetting what lies behind. It's gone. It's in the past. It's done and dusted. You can't keep getting it back. You can't keep resting in your successes. And you can't keep living and reliving those horrible memories. Forget what lies behind. Leave it there. The runner in a race, the athlete who was trained and focused on their event, conditioned and seasoned, that is now competing with the sole purpose of winning, will not be looking over his or her shoulder to see how far they've come or what they've left behind. Their focus is on the finish line. Their eyes are firmly fixed on the prize to grow deeper and stronger in our Christian faith, to run the Christian race with purpose and direction. As you look back on a new year, look forward to a new year, Paul urges us to forget what lies behind. In this instance, forget. It does not mean to fail to remember. Our lives are flooded with memories of all types of things. The very, the very best times and also the very 
difficult and our worst times. We all have those memories and we wish we could live the good things over and over and over again. They were special times and yet those horrible memories that we just wish we could erase and never see them again. When the Bible says forget, what it's saying is it means we no longer need to be influenced or affected by those things in our past. So forgetting those things that lie behind, forgetting the past, does not suggest that we can somehow magically erase our memories or the consequences of our our decision-making. But this simply means that because of what Jesus Christ has done through the cross and by coming to him as my saviour, Jesus has broken the power and the hold so that our past no longer controls us or influences us. We are now free, free to live for him, to run the race, no longer looking back with regret and disappointment and hurt, forgetting what lies behind, leave it there. I have no doubt that the Apostle Paul has a past that he would rather forget. In 1 Corinthians 15 verse 9, listen to these words, the humility in Paul's voice as he recounts his past, but in reflection of God's grace and mercy. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle. And why? Because I persecuted the church. Before Paul was saved, He persecuted the church. Don't you think Paul had a past he'd rather forget? And then Joseph, when Joseph met his brothers for the very first time after they sold him into slavery, and Joseph reveals himself to them because they didn't even recognize him in this place that he was, and Joseph had every right to make his brothers pay, to bring back the past because now look what's happened to me. Look what you did and now where I am. But that's not how Joseph responded. In Genesis 45, we read how Joseph responded. And he kissed all his brothers. And he wept over them. Joseph, he forgot what was lying behind and he left it there. And the beautiful reminder of what Jesus Christ has done. By his completed work on the cross, the people of Israel were looking towards a saviour, a new covenant, so they too could forget the past and hear what God's promises were through Jesus. And here they are speaking through the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, verse 34. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbour, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sins No more. By putting our our faith in Jesus, we are forgiven. Our sinful past is forgotten. Praise God. And God is wanting us to accept his grace and enabling for the present and move on with what he's calling us to do now. So when we ask ourselves this question, how do I find joy and hope in living a new year for God when I'm struggling to forget the one I've just had? Not only is Paul urging us to forget what lies behind, to just leave it there, but he's also wanting us to focus on what's ahead, to aim for the right goal. And here are the words that Paul uses. Look down in the second part of verse 13, Philippians 3, and he says it. And straining forward to what lies ahead. As we're running the Christian race, no longer looking over our shoulder or being distracted or weighed down by our past, but we are straining. We are straining forward to what lies ahead. There is something greater. There is something more worthy than we are running towards. And it's going to take effort to get there. The marathon runner that stretches and he strains every muscle, pushing every part of their body to its physical and mental limit. It's going to hurt. It's going to take perseverance and it's going to take grit. But we're not running this race alone. We're not doing it alone. We have Jesus. Our strength and spiritual endurance comes from the power of his Holy Spirit who is running within us. I love how James expresses this when it comes to straining forward. 
when you're in the middle of tough situations and trial. In James chapter 1, verse 2, we know this so well, and it's so hard to say and to read. But count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness, let it have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. You see, precious diamonds are formed by bits of carbon that under extreme temperature and high pressures over long periods of time, and only then are those diamonds made beautiful and valuable. And just ask our baristas how hard it is to make that perfect coffee. The grinder has to be set right. You need to tamper down the filter handle with the right compaction and then a perfect amount of pressure to ensure the coffee comes out just at the right flow, not too quick and not too slow, just the way you like it. And see, these simple examples, it illustrates how Paul wants us to run the Christian race by straining forward to what lies ahead because effort, the struggle, the perseverance will develop something far more precious than diamonds and something far more tasty than the perfect cup of coffee. So what is it? What is the goal as Christians that we are straining for? What is it that lies ahead that is so valuable and so precious and so worthy? It's the joy and the beauty that comes from becoming more like Jesus every day. That our lives are constantly being changed to reflect and deepen the character of Christ in us. That's our goal It's the most valuable, worthy calling to be first called, to be saved by Christ, to be justified by our faith and then by God's grace and his enabling power, living for Jesus every day, learning and growing and maturing in our faith, being sanctified for we are set apart to worship and give glory to God in our lives in spite of our situations because this requires us to have an attitude of straining forward and pressing on this is the treasure that paul is unveiling in verse 12 of our text look down and see what it says not that i have already obtained this or am already made perfect but i press on to make it my own because christ jesus has made me his own you see there is one good reason There is one good reason why we should live our lives straining forward to what lies ahead to pursue a Christ-like character before anything else. And what is it? What is it that is so powerful and so special? It's because Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ has made me his own. He has purchased my life with his precious blood on the cross. That should have been me. That should have been you on the cross. But Jesus Christ, he has made us his own and he has called me into his family. It's because of his great love and grace that I now want to, I want to love him in return. I want to love him. I want to please the king of kings by how I live because my actions in my heart They are demonstrations of my love and devotion towards Jesus and towards others. So when you're about to begin a new year and we find ourselves asking that question of how do I find joy and hope in living a new year for God when I'd rather forget the one that I just had? Well, not only do we need to forget the past and just leave it behind and then focus on what lies ahead by aiming for the right goal in our lives. But Paul, in his letter to the Philippians, is urging a third attitude to take place. Forward press. Press on towards it. Keep on moving. Let's look down and read verse 14 of our text and see how Paul says it. I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. To press on. With intense endeavor, just like a hunter eagerly pursues its prey. The winning athlete does not win by watching YouTube how to win videos, reading books of what it feels like to win, 
or listening to podcasts of other great runners. But he gets into the game. He gets into the game and he's into the race with an attitude that is set for endurance, determined to win. In the spiritual sense, Paul was never content with where he was at. He had a holy dissatisfaction and so he knew that he had to keep pressing on. Yesterday's blessings or experiences, well, they're no longer going to cut up for today. And he walked daily with the Lord, always seeking more, to become more like Christ, always learning, always growing in his faith, but never content or satisfied to tread water or to coast. And Paul knew that absolute perfection was something that he could never achieve in his lifetime. No matter how hard he worked, no matter how hard he tried, no matter how hard he persevered or pursued or ran, but it gave him hope and it gave him direction. And so here's the, here's the prize. We read in verse 14, the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, the highest and greatest calling of all, that one day God will call his children home to all those that he has made his own through faith in Jesus Christ into an eternity with him. We sang about that worship today in, our, in a revelation song. There is no more pain, no more sorrow, no more regret, no more hurt, no more suffering, no more brokenness, no more tears in a glorious and majestic heaven, worshipping an almighty God and Savior. We're at last, at last, we will be made like him, like Jesus, perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. What a day. What a prize. There is no greater reward than a runner in the Christian race can fix their eyes upon. So how do I press on with Jesus? In what ways can I build my character? How can I strengthen my faith? And how can I run the race with endurance and a clear line of sight? One of the things I love about City Reach Baptist Church is our vision statement. But the way that it, it centers around the gospel and it seeks to prioritize the vertical elements of our church and our relationship with Jesus before anything else. And then our relationships to others, our brothers and sisters in Christ and those in our community and beyond who don't, need, don't yet know Jesus. That we gather to exalt Jesus, to worship and honor our Savior, that we might grow to become like Jesus in our character, in Christ-like character every day, in order that we might give to serve like Jesus, as this helps us to build and strengthen our faith, using our gifts that he has blessed us with to serve and build others up, so at all times we are ready to go and willing to share Jesus, because this is the Great Commission. You see, being active in my local church where I can serve the Lord with focus and passion, where I'm loved and cared for by fellow Christians who spur each other on to keep looking forward, keep pressing on in mission towards the greater call. Forgetting what lies behind and pressing on to grow in Christ-like character, eyes fixed on Jesus, ready to tackle a new year. And another year, and another year, because we're not alone. We're a body. And Paul wants the Philippians to be filled with joy and thanksgiving and hope because of the gospel and to press on towards Christ no matter what their situation is. Remember our story with Florence Chadwick? She was attempting to cross the Catalina Channel and it was the only time that she had ever quit. Well, two months later, she swam the same channel again, freezing cold waters, dangerous currents, and once again, thick, dense fog that obscured her view. But this time, she swam with her faith intact, and she had her eyes fixed on the coast. She knew that the land, her finish line, was somewhere behind the fog, and she forgot what was behind her. She focused on what lay ahead and pressed on, regardless of the fog, to complete her, her win in record time. So as we begin a new year, 
And we're facing this question of how do I find joy and hope in living a new year for God when I'm struggling to forget the one that I just had? Well, let's remember the one thing that Paul wants us to see in his letter to the Philippians that is also true for us, that we need to forget the past. Leave it behind because Jesus has redeemed us. And then secondly, we focus on what's ahead by aiming for the right goal because Jesus wants us to be like him. And then thirdly, we need to press on, keep moving with a teachable heart because Jesus has already won the race. Press on with a deep desire to become more like Jesus every day, with your eyes firmly and gladly fixed on the prize, the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. What a day of rejoicing that will be to see and meet our Savior, our precious Redeemer, the Lord Jesus, face to face. So like the long-distance swimmer and the marathon runner, as we run the Christian race, with those unexpected circumstances arise, when they come and they will, when we feel like our lives are being swept off course by strong, fluence of, strong currents of influence, and when our vision appears to be clouded or uncertain, remember these words in Philippians. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let's keep pressing on. A new year is about to begin. Our race is not yet won. We must keep running and pressing on towards Jesus.